actually lefty tighty. You know how they say lefty loosey? Yeah. When it comes to a saw blade, it's lefty tighty because if it was righty tighty, it would spin loose with the rotation of the blade. Well, of course. So they turn it the other way. Here you go, Jess. <laughs> Ratio? No, you must have trapped. <laughs> now it's really loose. <laughs> well, this may is maybe, not maybe being... your hammer could be. Oh, but then it'll probably hit you. Out. Hold on. Okay, that's as tight as it goes. That's all I have to do. Shouldn't have to find custom work gear. They should just have my size in the shop. <laughs> you know, most things I need have to be a special order. You're special. I have many thoughts about that. Okay. Finishing carpentry. Let's teach Jess how to do finishing carpentry. The idea is that if he can teach me, then you'll definitely get it. Okay, so we've got finishing carpentry to do here in the living room in order to get completely ready for the painter. And it really is just skirting, some window jams, and some architraves. So basically we start at the bottom here because we've already got the architraves done over there. We're not going to have architraves over here, but that's we'll talk about that later. Let's do some skirting. Okay, so this skirting is just sitting here on the ground. It's not nailed or anything. And if you look at it carefully, you can see that there's an uneven gap underneath it. And that's because we've got hardwood flooring here. And obviously hardwood flooring on an old house isn't very flat. On a new house, you might be lucky, but usually you have to scribe the skirting to match the floor. And that's exactly what we've got to do. Do I have to wear this? I'm finding it very cumbersome. But you can take it off. Really. And like it's it cool. Just for the intro. <laughs> So in order to scribe to the floor, there's many ways you can scribe to a floor. I've just ripped this little piece here that's about three to four mil thick. I'll put the imperial there. It's nice and smooth so it won't scuff up the floor, but it gives us something to scribe against. There's many ways to do this. This is just how I'm doing it. So what I'm looking for when I want to scribe this is the biggest gap. And I'm hoping that this packer that I've ripped is at least as thick as the biggest gap and it looks yeah, it's not perfect, it could go a bit more, but I think we're going to have to live with that. So sorry, you, you make this as wide as the widest point? You make this as thick as the biggest gap. That's what I meant? Yeah. Okay, how did you know? I just guessed. An experienced guess. Educated guess. An educated guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alright, so you make sure that the skirting is hard down, you place your Little wee scribing piece down, and then you go crazy with the marking. A nice thin pencil is the way to go. This is the Pika, um, I think 0.9, I think it's called. See this here, I don't know who did the flooring here. But God, they did a wonky job. Flame Ray. Yeah, he's not here. You have to do this all the way along? All the way along. So surely there'd be a more official way of doing this, like now but it'll have something that holds the this down and then just sliding this along. Well, another way you could do it is you could put some pins in and then pull it out. Okay. That's another way. So if you were by yourself. That would be a good way, yeah. Jeez. You almost hit butted me there. Sorry. Almost gave you a Glasgow kiss. Oh my god, how am I supposed to, I'm like a dog with a stick that's too big for it. I'm stuck! You're kidding. No? If I turn, I whack a wall. You look like you're trying to walk a tightrope. That's how I feel. I just don't want to whack anything. I spent all this money on all this plastering and painting. Doing a great job. Oh, thanks. I always put the planner on a slight angle so you're cutting more off the back of the skirting than you are off the front because really the only thing that matters is that the front of the skirting gets hard down to the floor.
Got to get it perfect to that mill, eh, Scott? Well, yeah. I mean, you're putting two timber surfaces side by side with one another. You can do the old do your best and cork the rest, but I think it's better to get them as close as possible and there might still be some filling that the painter does, but you don't want to make his job any harder than it needs to be. Do your best and cook the rest. I love that. Yeah, I didn't make that up. <laughs> All right, let's see how good I was. All right, so when you push that down, still needs a bit of work, I think. So over here is like the real challenging part. So we've got that little dip there, right? That's touching, so it's keeping the rest of it off. Might have to turn this around that way and be more particular with our marking here. So now that I push it down, I'm getting pretty close to what we want. It's not an airtight fit, but it's a lot closer. We are ready to cut it to lens. Now the thing to remember is that now I've made one side all squiggly to match the floor. So the two sides of the skirting are not equal any longer. The bottom squiggly and the top has a single bevel like this. See that little slope? That's the detail at the top. And we've laid the skirting like this with the bevel at the top. But if I go and cut this that way, I'm probably going to tear out the top bevel because of the way the blade spins, which we don't want. So I've got this little ripping, which has got the same angle as my single bevel. Now to stop that tear out from happening, I'm going to grab this here, match the two angles to one another, and push hard in to the fence. See that? No tear out. And same here, it's all clean. Usually the way to avoid tear out would be to turn it around so the bottom of the skirting is facing the fence and then you're cutting into the bevel, but the bottom of our skirting is all squiggly, so we can't do that. Is squiggly the technical term? Yeah. Oh, I feel like squiggles actually. Oh, don't say that, we've got work to do. Okay. So now that we've got it fitting how we want it, we have to make a decision about where we put the join. Now I've decided to put the mitre down at this end. Unfortunately, we're like, what, one foot away from the corner of the whole room. So basically you want to put your join somewhere where if the join ever opens up, you're not really going to see it. Shouldn't matter. You should glue and pin it so you don't see it regardless. But I always like to turn the mitre away from the predominant viewing point, which will be in this case over here. All the living, kitchen, doors, entryway, light, everything's coming from that direction. So I'm turning the mitre away from that. So before I do that, I'm going to cut my last piece to make sure that I can fit it in. And then we'll pop it on. So what I did there was I marked the top of the skirting, the long skirting. And then I dragged that same skirting to the end and marked the top again. So now I've got two marks here. And now I'm putting this up to it. And it's telling me that this needs to come down a couple of mil. And I mark the wall like that. So I've marked the point and I've shown myself where the angle is. So on the drop saw, we know which angle to cut. Now this is the way I was talking about before. You have the single bevel facing outward, so when the blade goes in, you get a cleaner cut. And I can do it this time because the bottom is parallel to the top. Do you think the whole video will just be you in this corner? <laughs> when I learned how to do skirtings, a guy called Dean, a carpenter called Dean, was the guy who taught me. He was a deaf guy, this, it's not part of the story, but he, he would, the way he explained it to me was, what you're trying to achieve is you're trying to hide the join. So he'd set me a challenge, there were long hallways, like 20 meter long hallways, 
He goes, you, you run the skirting on there and I'll come back. And if I can find the join, then you haven't done a good job. So that was my goal, was to join all the mitres so perfectly that you couldn't see the join. And when he came back later on, he walked down the hallway, had a look, came back and went, good job. Can't find them. That was the Rialto Newmarket, wasn't it? Oh yeah, if you're, if you're so in So if you're in Auckland, next time you go to the Rialto movie theater in Newmarket, you look at those. Those skirtings? You look at those skirtings, you look for those joints and you let us know. If you're walking into the <laughs> cinema, it's, it's the part from the, where you buy your tickets and then you go to the cinema, all those hallways. If you see any joints, you can be like, Scott. Scott Brown, you're useless. <laughs> Squarespace is a website building platform where you can stand out and succeed online. Whether you have an e-commerce business or you have services like building or catering or music lessons, you can advertise it all on Squarespace using their wide array of templates that are customizable. Drag and drop your own information, your photos, your text, and Squarespace will do the rest. They'll optimize everything so it looks good on your phone, looks good on your iPad, looks good on your desktop. You don't have to adjust it. If you're selling stuff, they have e-commerce tools built in, so you can sell all your products right there on your website. They also have custom domain names, so you can get scottbrowncarpentry.com, or actually you can't do that because that's what I did for my website, which I also built with Squarespace. I should say we, because Jess did most of the work. So if you want a custom domain name, you can do it all in Squarespace. It also has SEO tools, if you're interested in tracking that. Honestly, it's a one-stop shop for website building. It's a no-brainer. But you don't have to believe me because they also have a free trial. I'm going to let this truck drive past. And then when you're ready to launch your own website, head over to squarespace.com forward slash Scott Brown Carpentry and you can save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you sincerely to Squarespace for sponsoring this channel. It helps us a lot. Back to the show. Put two shots and then turn it around the other angle and go a third shot. I like to put an angle on it so it doesn't just pull out, so it's okay. hard to pull out. And you just want to push it down so it's hard to the ground as you go. So, like that? Yep, but make sure you use your left hand to push it down. Oop, shit. Like that? Yep. Yep, and then turn around the other way. Like that? Yep. Cool. Why get you to do the rest? Just feel like I'm going to do it wrong. No, no, you're doing a good job. It was finishing carpentry TV where I learned that. Nail it in on an angle. Huh, and why again? Uh, it just helps it grab better. Oh yeah. Because it's not going to pull out as easily. Yeah. Shout out to Richard. Well, he knows finishing carpentry. I mean, it's in the name. <laughs> well, I think I failed the can you see the join test. But as a good carpenter I used to work for used to say, a good painter will fix that. What do you do here? You can't have that. Two ugly things butt into one another. So this is what I do on a single bevel corner like this. Is I butt it in, make sure it's sitting nice and tight. And then I indicate the angle for my future self. So what we do is we cut that mitre that we just indicated on the top. So it's just that 45 into the corner. Don't know if I'm describing that well for you guys watching, but I'll just show you. How about that? So we've cut this mitre. Now the next thing is we bring this saw back over and then we go beyond zero. The angle doesn't matter. I tend to go 10 degrees. So I'm sorry if you can't see me, but this is what we do. So I've created this little slice here. Now I just got to complete the slice, making sure that I keep the top part intact. And that's the part that has the miter on it. There you go. And then give it a push. Oh, that is satisfying. Yeah? So it's got a cut on the back. Yeah, like this tiny little bit of timber sitting on the top. How do you stop that from breaking though? Well, you just have to be careful. And once you've glued it and nailed it, it won't be a problem. I see. This is a coping cut. It's coped. 
Okay. Because usually you would use a coping saw to do it. I'm barely coping with this tutorial, but yeah. all right. <laughs> Now, obviously it's important to do a good job and be tidy, but it's also important to find ways to be efficient. So when I'm on site, I kind of do this. I'll go around and I'll cut everything rough, just a little bit longer than it needs to be. And then maybe I'll put a miter on one end if there's gonna be a miter. I've done that over here. And then I keep a couple of miter samples, I guess you could call them. So down here, I'll be able to line my corner up. It's pretty good there. And then I can hold it in place and get my mark here at the short point of this miter using the corner of the wall here as my guide. And then always indicate the angle. Now rather than running away and cutting that, I'll pick up this one and do the same here. And then I've also got one over on that side. And then I can do this one. So having the angle indicated really helps when you do this kind of thing because you're cutting so many miters at once. You're not gonna remember, right? And then we do all three cuts. So this part here, usually I would just hook my tape on like this and measure corner to corner and that would be my two short points. But another way you could do it, you could cut your piece longer than it needs to be, like that, and then flip it upside down and then make all the blood rush to your head. <laughs> or don't be silly and just mark the back like this and mark the back here and then You've got two marks there. That will be your short point. And then you just transfer those marks over to where you'll see them on the saw. And then what do you do? You do your angle indicators. So there's no confusion when you get back to the saw. Is that bottom doing? See, I'm higher than I need to be on both. How do you know that pulling the pencil on the bottom like that is the correct measurement? It's not the correct measurement, it's more about getting a parallel line. For instance, if I follow that pencil line, that's actually too much. Okay. It's actually too much if I take all that off, mm -hmm. but at least I've got a parallel line to cut to. That is how much I need to take off the bottom. So that's about two mil on the top there. That's what I really need to take off the bottom. So as long as my two mil cut is parallel to that bottom pencil mark, we're good. All right, I'm happy with that. Now this feature wall behind me, where all the internet boxes and stuff are, that doesn't need a skirting because it's gonna be, it's gonna have a built-in cabinet that I'm gonna build, which I'm very excited about. It's gonna be a while, it's low priority because we've got a kitchen, we've got a laundry, but it's gonna be nice. <laughs> 